Hello everyone. I'm Dane Christensen, the Digital Marketing Manager at Grid Gain Systems. And I want to thank you for attending today's webinar, Anatomy of an In-Memory Data Fabric, JCash and Beyond. Your presenter today is Dimitri Citrakin, Co-Founder and Vice President of Engineering at Grid Gain Systems, as well as the chairman of the project management committee for the Apache Ignite project. He'll be providing a deep dive into how Apache Ignite works today. But before we get into Dimitri's presentation, I wanted to cover just a few housekeeping items for you. First, you can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the yellow help widget, which covers common technical issues. If you have any questions for Dimitri about the content at any point during the webcast, you can click on the red Q&A widget to submit your question. Dimitri will answer questions during the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. It's possible we may not have time to get to all the questions during this live event, but if he isn't able to get to your question, we will certainly follow up with a response by email. A copy of today's slide deck in PDF format uh, will be available in the green resource list widget. And an on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the web webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier or from the GridGain website. So with that, we're ready to turn the floor over to Dimitri Citrake. Dimitri? Thank you, Dean. Uh, again, my name is Dmitry Sitrakin. I'm a founder and uh, EVP of engineering at Grid Gain System. I'm also a chair of Apache Ignite PMC. And today, given that the title of the webinar is Anatomy of a Memory Data Fabric, I thought that we should get anatomically correct and actually go through uh, most of the components a memory data fabric has or should have. So we'll be talking about clustering, uh, data grid. Data grid will focus in some detail. It's one of the biggest components we provide. There's also compute grid, streaming service grid. And we'll also talk about uh, Patch Ignite, uh, Spark, and Hadoop features, uh, such as our in-memory file system and memory map producing memory uh, RDDs for Spark. And at the end, we'll do a cool demo comparing Ignite SQL uh, there is a Spark SQL, and uh, go over differences. All right, so let's take a look at what in-memory data fabric is. Essentially, the main purpose of in-memory data fabric is to improve performance and scalability of your application. And we do it by providing a collection of independent, but yet very well integrated with each other components. All of them have to do with in-memory computing, and all of them have to do with improving performance and scale. Uh, all of these components can be used independently from each other, but when used together, they actually provide a nice uh, integration which uh, uh, essentially does improve the, perform the overall performance and scale. For example, if you use data grid together with compute grid and you need to send a computation to a node where the data, uh, to, to a node to compute on some data, you want to make sure that this computation, computation goes exactly to the node where the data resides. Otherwise, you would create a lot of extra network traffic and most likely would um, uh, worsen the scalability uh, rather than improve it. So all these components uh, provide this type of integration. The same goes for uh, streaming, same goes for uh, service grid, etc. So despite all these features, uh, despite such a broad feature set uh, in Apache Ignite, the project is actually very easy to install and very easy to use. Uh, it comes as a zip file. In order to install it, all you need to do is unzip it and you're ready to go. And we, and the APIs are very simple. We try to use as much, uh, we try to use as many standard APIs as possible. For example, we have standard queues, sets, maps, all of them in cluster distributed fashion. We also implement JSR 107 standard, uh, and we also add distribution and other extra clustering features to it. So the project is very simple to uh, to use, and uh, it also brings only one mandatory dependency to your application. It's fully mavenized, and the only dependency you need to add would be ignitecore.jar. 
other dependencies you will bring on a la carte basis. For example, if you have, uh, uh, if you need to use Spring configuration, you would add Spring dependency. If you want to use Hibernate persistence, you would need to add Hibernate dependency. But by default, the project will, uh, only requires one jar, which is Ignite Core and jar. And last uh, thing that I'll add here is uh, that there are no hardware requirements to running uh, Apache Ignite cluster. And we'll utilize pretty much all the resources you make available to the cluster. Uh, if uh, you have high-end servers with maybe 500 gig of RAM and 64, uh, cores, of, uh, 64 cores available, uh, we'll, we'll utilize uh, all that memory and uh, all, those, all that CPU power. Uh, also, if you have a low-end server, 10, maybe 10 gig of RAM and maybe four cores only. I and mean, we'll utilize the, those resources as well. Of course, you, you will able, you will not be able to cache as much data in a 10 gig uh, of RAM server, but maybe you can stack them up, horizontally scale them, and actually collectively cache a lot of data together. So this jigsaw puzzle actually represents most of the components available available within Apache Ignite. Data Grid, of course, being one of our biggest components, uh, has uh, most of the code written. Uh, it provides uh, distributed in-memory cache. Uh, it partitions data in memory and adds transactional, lots of transactional and queuing capabilities to that data. But it's not the only component we have. Uh, I like to say that Ignite is more than the data grid more than just a data grid. We also have a compute grid, fairly feature-rich com uh, compute grid. We have service grid for deploying singleton services onto the cluster. We have streaming for ingesting large amounts of data. We integrate with uh, very well with Hadoop and Spark environments. We provide an in-memory file system, in-memory data structures, et cetera, et cetera. So all these components are available within Apache Ignite, and today we'll focus a little bit on, on most of them. So let's start uh, with clustering. The main feature of any clustering product is to make sure that nodes can discover each other in every environment. And every clustering environment is very different. For example, um, the private cloud uh, has certain features that are not available on a public cloud. For example, multicast may not be uh, available on a public cloud. Uh, public cloud also, also has some shared storages that may not be available on private cloud. So it's important that your clustering product plugs in uh, automatically into all those environments, be that a private cloud and Amazon public cloud, maybe Google Compute Engine, maybe maybe a local laptop. So we ensure that Ignite cluster can actually be automatically brought up on all in any environment you started in, and we do that by making our uh, discovery protocol pluggable. So we have different plugin, different implementations that are plugged in for different environments. Uh, maybe you, uh, if you're starting on a local laptop or within a private network, we'll use multicast-based discovery. If you're starting on Amazon S3, uh, AWS, we'll use, uh, we'll utilize Amazon S3 storage as a discovery mechanism, and so on. And I also want to add that uh, the Ignite works very well with Docker. And we do provide uh, Docker containers out of the box as well. So do take advantage of that if you're running uh, uh, in a container environment. So let's talk about data grid. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we implement a very nice API, a very nice standard called JSR 107, which is a standard for local caching. Then essentially, it provides a very nice API which in many ways similar to concurrent Java Util concurrent map, concurrent map API uh, and provides a lot of atomic uh, operations on that map, like uh, put if absent, replace, remove, et cetera. It also provides, uh, a, bill, uh, provides uh, a mechanism uh, for collocated processing via entry processor and uh, also has um, uh, various events, various metrics, and allows you to plug in your own persistence. It's very important. Persistence is always import, an important part. If you already have your data stored in, let's say, Oracle database, you don't have to replace it. Keep storing it in Oracle. Ignite will automatically write through cache updates to your Oracle database. And it, whenever a read happens, 
if the data is not cached, cached it will automatically uh, read it through from Oracle database or from any other database for that matter. We automatically integrate with any type of RDBMS or any other persistence uh, that you may have, uh, you may be working with. We also support the right behind mode, which essentially allows you to accumulate updates to the database in um, one batch and then flush that batch to the database asynchronously. Uh, this basically allows you to uh, reduce the load that would be imposed on the database by frequent updates and actually improve overall performance. So those, those features come with, uh, uh, by implementing JCAST standard. But on top of that, Ignite adds clustering and distribution. As I mentioned, JCAST is just a standard for local caching. So uh, Ignite, need, uh, Ignite actually adds data partitioning capabilities, data querying capabilities in a distributed fashion, transactions, distributed transactions. You can look at it as a distributed key value store and uh, where every node actually owns a portion of the data. And collectively across all the nodes, you have your total memory available to your cluster. And you can transact across multiple nodes uh, in asset fashion. Uh, and Ignite is actually fully asset compliant. At no time you will get an inconsistent read or inconsistent write within Apache Ignite cluster. The data is always consistent and each transaction will either commit as one unit or fail as one unit regardless of the failures, whether failure happens on the client side, on server side, on a primary copy or on a, back, or, or on a backup copy. On top of that, uh, from a querying standpoint, we support ANSI 99 SQL, where uh, it's a very unique feature of Apache Ignite. We're virtually the only product uh, within in-memory data grid market which supports SQL in, uh, and is compliant with, uh, and is ANSI 99 compliant. Uh, so you can pretty much run any type of SQL on top of Apache Ignite. You can do distributed joins, you can do group bytes, having clauses, you can do sorting, uh, averages, uh, all sorts of aggregation functions, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I'll, have, I'll show you a couple of SQL examples on some following slides. And uh, all the queries are actually execute fast because we're doing indexing in memory. So all the indexes are kept in memory and all the index lookups are pretty fast. So this diagram actually shows how the data is distributed within Apache Ignite cluster. Uh, it shows actually there are different ways how you can distribute data. You can just partition it, you can replicate it. This uh, diagram shows a partition cache. And essentially here we have four server nodes, namely JVM 1, 2, 3, and 4, and a client node, client, uh, which remotely connects to, to the data cluster. And we have keys, A, B, C, D, and as, as, as you see, keys are uh, evenly distributed within the cluster, so every node becomes an owner of a certain key. Uh, if you have more keys, then every node would actually have become an owner of a collection of keys. And one of the interesting things here is that there's no uh, backup server. We don't, have, we don't backup servers, we backup keys. So if you look at this diagram, all the keys are, all the backups, backup copies for the, keys are also evenly distributed within cluster. So for example, if one cluster node has 10 keys, then uh, some uh, backups will end up on node two, some backups will end up on node three, and some backups will end up on node four. So backups are also evenly distributed within the cluster. We do it to make sure that if uh, any of the node crashes, the, uh, you don't get another node all of a sudden overloaded. Since backups are evenly distributed, the extra load uh, will also be evenly distributed within the cluster. And lastly, I want to uh, bring your attention to how a client connection works. We have a concept of near cache. So it's a cache that you can uh, instantiate on a client side, and it provides a local, it's a smaller local cache available to a client. And the way it works is like, for example, if a key A is accessed and it's not in a near cache, then a request to a node in this, on this diagram, to JVM1 will be made, and JVM1 has a primary is a primary holder of of key one. So it will ship the key one, uh, ship the key A back to the client, and then uh, will cache it in a near cache and uh, return it to user. If you're trying to access key B on this diagram, key B is already 
present in your cache, so no no request to the server is made. So replicated caches actually work a bit differently from partition cache. If uh, replicated caches um, actually hold the whole data set in the memory of each node. If in partition scenario we took the data set and we split it across multiple nodes, so the more nodes you add, the more data you can cache. In a replicated scenario, each node holds the full data set. So uh, by adding more nodes, you are not actually adding more memory to your cluster. And updates in replicated caches are a lot more expensive than in partition caches. In a partition cache, uh, cache scenario, we only had to update primary copy and as many backups as, as you have configured. Uh, if you have 10 nodes in the cluster, you'll only update primary and backups. Let's say if you have one backup, you only update primary and one backup. If you have 100 nodes in the cluster, you again update only primary and backup. 1,000 nodes in the cluster, same thing. In a replicated cache, the more nodes you add, the more network, uh, network trips you would have to make to do an update. If you have 100 nodes in the cluster, then you up, have to update all 100 nodes. So the updates are very expensive, and therefore replicated caches should not be used in scenarios where updates are frequent. Uh, the predominant use case for replicated caches is to cache lookup data or reference data, data that gets read a lot but is not updated a lot. And, and typically in, a deploy in your deployments, you will end up with some combination of the two. You probably will have maybe 20 partition caches, maybe five replicated caches. The cool thing here is that you can transact between those caches. So all, all, all different caches can participate in the same transaction. Transaction supports multiple caches. And you also can query and do joins, distributed joins between multiple caches. So let's take a look at how Ignite stores the data. We have a concept called off-heap memory. And for anybody who worked with Java uh, would know that Java does not work very well with large amounts of heap. Essentially, Java works well with maybe between 16 and 20 gig of RAM. And if you go beyond that, then you run into uh, lengthy GC pauses. In our own experiments, if you have a cluster, let's say, of 10 nodes uh, with 50 gigabyte of RAM allocated to each node, you may end up with a GC pause uh, of about five minutes. And that actually is unacceptable for most of the production environment. So to solve this problem, Ignite introduces uh, a uh, concept called off-heap memory, where essentially the data is still stored in memory. It's still a pointer access away. So it's, the access to the off-heap memory is very fast. Except that now JVM does not know about this memory, uh, and uh, therefore garbage collection is not affected. So the way you would use off-heap memory is you would allocate for your JVM as much memory as you would uh, uh, do without Ignite even being there. So you would allocate only the memory that your own application requires. And then you would specify how much memory Ignite should, should use for its off-heap storage. And Ignite will actually start allocating most of the cache, da all of the cache data off-heap. One of the differences, uh, one of the differentiating features of Ignite off-heap implementation is that we also keep indexes of heap. It is very important uh, distinction because uh, indexes generally occupy maybe, may, may occupy anywhere between 30 and 50% of your overall um, data set because uh, uh, depending on how aggressively you index. So if you're already caching maybe 100 gigabyte of data and you have 30 gigabyte of indexes, uh, you sh they should be stored on uh, off heap, not on heap. If you store them on heap, then you are back to square one and you're having the same GC problem. So Ignite actually supports storing indexes off heap, uh, also in off heap storage, which makes uh, indexes work uh, very well uh, with GC, with garbage collection. Another cool feature that we recently added to Ignite is uh, deadlock-free transactions. If anybody who actually worked with uh, uh, transactions and distributed locks would know that uh, um, it's important to always worry, always keep track of the order in which you acquire locks, because if at any point you make you acquire locks in the wrong order, you would end up with a deadlock situation. So Ignite actually introduced a deadlock-free transaction mode or a fail-fast transaction mode where we optimistically uh, 
proceed with the transaction without acquiring any locks. So you don't have to worry about lock order. You can uh, actually do updates within different transactions in different order, and you will never end up in a deadlock scenario. But at the same time, if uh, and we resolve most of the contention. So if you're updating the same keys, most likely your update will uh, – if you're updating the same keys from multiple threads, most likely your update will go through. But at the same time, sometimes uh, when it's impossible to resolve, we optimistically fail the transaction with an optimistic exception and allow a user to retry it. Uh, this mode actually makes it possible to work uh, uh, to transact across multiple components uh, in uh, organizations that have large teams that access those com APIs of those components in any order. So it's almost impossible to uh, actually coordinate, uh, add a coordination of lock ordering across multiple teams within a project. So uh, dead lock free transaction is definitely a preferable way. And on, on top of that, uh, the transactions are actually faster because we don't acquire any locks and we always optimistically proceed. The transaction actually performs a lot faster than uh, uh, the pessimistic uh, the, than its pessimistic counterpart, which actually pessimistically acquires lock. So do take advantage of this functionality. It's a pretty cool feature. Another recent addition uh, to Apache Ignite is our cross-platform binary protocol. So starting with version 1.5, uh, we completely switched uh, by default. Uh, now we completely switched uh, to storing data in binary format. So you actually never have to deploy classes on the server side we, because we'll always serialize them on the client side and keep them serialized on the server side. Our indexing and our queries are able to look inside of the binary format, so you never even have to deserialize them to do index lookups or specific field lookups. So very efficient protocol, very compact protocol, and the cool thing here is that it's cross-platform. And again, another cool addition in Ignite 1.5 is that we have added uh, C++ and .NET C# -sharp APIs to Apache Ignite. And the difference in our .NET and C++ integration is that uh, it's not only client, it's not that .NET, for example, can connect to the grid only using client API. It's a full-fledged in-memory data fabric um, available for .NET. You can transact from .NET, you can do near caching from uh, .NET, you can even execute .NET closures in collocated fashion on top of your Apache Net cluster. You can utilize .NET persistence. You don't have to implement Java persistence. You can use .NET persistence. So the goal here is to make sure that if you're using .NET, you do not have to write a single line of code in Java. We're not 100% there yet, but we're uh, with every release, we're getting closer and closer. And it's already uh, fairly feature-rich uh, in-memory data fabric for .NET and for C++. As I mentioned before, one of the unique features of Apache Ignite is our uh, SQL uh, capabilities and ability to query data using standard NC99 SQL. All the queries are always consistent. They return consistent data, and they execute in a full torrent fashion. So regardless of a crash within the cluster, the queries will always return a consistent result. That is actually very different from the way some other products support uh, querying capabilities. Uh, there, uh, there's virtually no limit to the C SQL queries you can execute on top of Apache Ignite. If you're working with Java classes, essentially the class name will become a table name. The fields in the class will, be, will become columns. You tell us which fields you want to index, and after that you can execute pretty much any type of query. You can do distributed joins. You can do uh, group bytes. Uh, you can do having clauses. You can do sorting order bytes. You can do any type of aggregation. Any type of SQL is supported. So SQL is yet another way you can interact with an Apache Ignite cluster. Uh, there are several ways. One is a key value API, which I mentioned with the data grid. Then another is a MapReduce API, which we'll talk about. Now there is an SQL API. And Ignite can also be exposed as a JDBC. And Ignite also comes with JDBC driver and ODBC driver. So you can interact with Ignite using standard JDBC, ODBC connectivity with, from any kind of standard uh, tool that supports it. Here is an example of a typical query that you can run on top of Apache Ignite. Uh, in this case, we simply uh, we simply uh, do a join between person and organization table, and we're querying 
uh, and we're doing a join based on uh, or organization ID field. So um, using standard SQL syntax, and we're also showing that you can use any type of SQL function. Here we're using concat function to concatenate first name and last name of a person. Uh, once we execute the query, we get a cursor back, and we can actually iterate through that cursor in paginated fashion or fetch all the data and at once and uh, store it in a collection. Here's another example of SQL. Uh, you can execute on top of Ignite. Here we're actually demonstrating group by and order by clauses and how they can be used. Again, we're using a distributed joins. And we're querying for uh, organization name and some uh, uh, average minimum and maximum uh, salaries of all people working within that organization. So we're doing a group by based on organization name, and we actually producing uh, several uh, utilizing average aggregate functions here. Again, one of the fairly simple queries uh, you can execute on top of Attach Ignite. So let's switch from data grid to compute grid. Compute grid is actually probably the second most utilized component available within Apache Ignite. And what it allows you to do is uh, distribute and execute closures and tasks within, um, within a cluster. So you can actually use it uh, to simply distribute uh, simple jobs, simple runnables, callables, or even uh, standard Java 8 lambdas within the cluster under high, high load. You can execute thousands of jobs per second. Or you can actually have a longer running job, uh, take a, lo a longer running task, split it into multiple jobs, and execute uh, those jobs in parallel within your cluster, uh, uh -huh. therefore making your task execute faster. This actually, paradigm actually is called fork join paradigm, and this is uh, exactly what is depicted on this diagram. We have a task C being split in multiple jobs, C1, C2, and C3. They execute in parallel within the cluster, and when then we get results, R1, R2, and R3, we aggregate them back and return them to user. Very fast, uh, fast implementation, very efficient algorithm for uh, distributed task execution. And we notice that it gets utilized in a lot more than standard MapReduce APIs, uh, simply because uh, MapReduce was never built for performance. As a matter of fact, for John is a edge case of a MapReduce API where both mapping and reduction happen on the client side. And uh, the assumption here is that mapping and reduction step usually would be uh, would execute fast, and there is no point on, in distributing them. So from an API standpoint, the APIs are pretty simple, but there is a lot of complexity that happens underneath. And for example, Ignite supports automatic load balancing for torrents. We support automatic job checkpointing for long-running jobs, et cetera. And all these components come uh, are pluggable. All the implementations are pluggable. For example, load balancing comes in several implementations. We have random load balancing. We have round-robin load balancing. Adaptive load balancing, where we pick the least loaded node based on some metrics uh, that we we'll, uh, constantly listen to the, uh, from all the nodes in the cluster. Uh, same goes for fault torrents. We have various fault torrents, failover, uh, pluggable failover implementations. As a matter of fact, Ignite comes with a guarantee that uh, regardless of what kind of failure happens in the cluster, no job will ever be lost. So as long as you have one cluster node standing, uh, Ignite job will always complete. And uh, checkpointing you would utilize whenever your job takes a long time. And you want to periodically checkpoint its state to make sure that in case of a crash, uh, whenever job gets restarted, it restarted from a last safe checkpoint. There are also other additional features available uh, within Ignite Compute Grid. So please do check them out, check it out. It's a pretty cool API, pretty simple API, and yet very powerful. Streaming is uh, another uh, component available within Apache Ignite. And essentially, the main goal of streaming is to make sure that you can continuously ingest large um, uh, amounts of data into your cluster. Uh, uh, streaming data never ends, so the, uh, you never are able to hold all the data you're streaming, and you only uh, generally work with a sliding window concept, a sliding window available within the cluster. As, as the data comes in, keeps coming, the sliding window keeps shifting together with the data. And uh, since sliding windows are based on top of uh, data grid caches, you, all the features available within data grid caches are also available within 
uh, streaming and sliding windows uh, capabilities, sliding windows APIs. For example, you can um, transact between sliding windows, you can query and you can join, do joins between sliding windows of data. So all that is available. So on one side, you're ingesting data and, uh, in uh, large amounts and large continuous uh, volumes into Ignite. And on the other side, you can actually execute SQL queries into that data and uh, into the averages or, or whatever, or other aggregates that you choose to maintain for that data for your streaming use case. But even if you do not have a continuous data stream and just want to preload your cache, utilizing streaming API is probably the best way to do it. So if you have large amount, a large amount of data that you simply want to ingest into, into your cache once, you still probably would take advantage of a streaming of our data streamer API to do so. Because what it will do is it will automatically batch all the data before it gets shipped to Node and actually ship data to Node in batches to provide the best uh, best possible throughput here. I'd like to mention uh, in Apache Ignite, before I switch to our uh, Spark and Hadoop uh, integration, is service, uh, service Grid. What Service Grid allows you to do is uh, one of the main features uh, uh, that service, uh, service Grid has is uh, ability to deploy cluster singletons. Uh, onto your clusters. Essentially, on, if you look at this diagram, we have a cluster singleton or we, and we have a node singleton. Uh, in case of a cluster singleton, the service will be deployed only once in, uh, onto your cluster. And if the node on which it ends up being deployed crashes, then uh, Ignite will guarantee that uh, the service will automatically be redeployed on another node. So the, uh, this ensures constant availability of your service. Uh, in case of a node singleton, we make sure that the service is always available on each node. But singleton is also just an edge case. As a matter of fact, you can control the number of services you, you're, you, you're able to deploy into the cluster. For example, you can uh, deploy, you can say that you only want uh, five instances of a service, and Ignite will automatically distribute these five instances across the cluster and make sure that no matter what kind of failure happens within your cluster, the number of your servers, services always remains five. So why would you need a service? Essentially, something, a lot of times you need uh, something that only happens once or only happens a controlled number of times. For example, maybe you have a uh, preloading process that takes place that uh, you need to preload uh, uh, data into the cluster from some remote data source. Uh, if this process crashes, you want it to automatically be restarted on a remote node. But uh, but if it doesn't, you want to actually uh, run it from start to end, complete it, uh, and make sure that it executes only once. Cluster Singleton actually is the best way to deploy and provide such capability in your cluster. And the last thing I want to talk about before we switch to Hadoop and Spark integration is benchmarking. Uh, I've been saying that Ignite is very fast. Uh, Ignite uh, improves performance of your applications. And how do we know it? We know it because we constantly benchmark it ourselves. Uh, we run benchmarks against previous versions of Ignite to make sure that the new releases are faster. And we always run it uh, against our competitor products. Uh, to uh, make sure. So we always know where we stand in comparison to the competition. As a matter of fact, uh, benchmarks of Ignite versus Hazelcast are available on Apache Ignite website. Uh, so I encourage you to come and take a look at our benchmarks. The code is also available. We use Yarstick as a distributed benchmarking framework. It produces very nice graphs, so you can take a look. And we're also working on benchmarking Ignite versus InfiniSpan. And when we finish that, we'll benchmark it uh, versus Cassandra as well. So let's talk about how Ignite can help with Hadoop and Spark installations. So first of all, I want to mention that Ignite uh, natively integrates with uh, Hadoop, Yarn, and Mesos clusters. So if you're running those clusters in your environment, Ignite will automatically integrate and automatically scale on demand as well. So let's take a look how Ignite can integrate uh, with Spark. As you know, Spark is very good about running computations in parallel and uh, uh, computing on data in parallel. What Spark is not very good at is about sharing state between those computations. All Spark jobs, all Spark tasks run in complete isolation from one another. And Ignite, on the other hand, 
is very good with sharing data. And we thought, why not just implement a native RDD API in Spark uh, and uh, base it on top of a cache and uh, provide uh, state sharing capabilities to Spark RDDs. So that's exactly what uh, Ignite Shared RDD does. It, uh, unlike Spark RDDs, the shared RDD provided by Ignite is mutable. So you can have one computation, one job or task, update this RDD, and another one uh, read the update. So this allows you to share state between various jobs, tasks, and applications. As a side effect, you also get a faster scale because a, Ignite Shared RDD is based on top of a cache or on top of a data grid. You get all the data grid features, and the indexed SQL is one of them. So whenever you actually run SQL on top of a Shared RDD, it executes a lot faster uh, than uh, in Spark because Spark always has to do full scans and Ignite utilizes indexes. And as a matter of fact, towards the end of this uh, presentation, I will do a quick demo comparing Spark SQL execution to Ignite SQL execution. Another way you can share state between Spark computations, Spark tasks, and Spark jobs is by utilizing uh, Ignite in memory file system. So the diagram, as you see, looks pretty similar to the shared RDD, except that here we can automatically persist data to a secondary file system such as HDFS or any other Hadoop compliant file system. And uh, the benefits uh, you get with a shared file system is, are pretty similar to the benefits you would get with shared RDD. Uh, so why use one versus another? When do you use file system uh, in memory file system, and when do you use the RDDs? And the answer is pretty simple. Sometimes you really do have to work with files. Sometimes you work with uh, CSV files, text files, log files, PNG files. And the most convenient way to store it uh, is uh, to use an in-memory file system. On the other hand, whenever you work with objects or key value pairs, the most convenient way to work with them is using uh, RDD format, sh uh, namely shared RDD in Ignite. So uh, the uh, selection of what, what to use, either uh, uh, RDD or a memory file system, is really based on your uh, use case. Yet another uh, useful integration between Ignite and Hadoop is our in-memory MapReduce implementation. If you ever uh, work with native Hadoop MapReduce, you probably know that it's not fast. It's actually pretty slow. And the reason that it's slow is because it was never built for performance. When you execute a Hadoop MapReduce task, essentially uh, you start with a uh, client, then you contact a job tracker, then a name node, then a task tracker, uh, then task tracker will go to IGFS node, IGFS node will go to disk, and all this process will bubble up, and probably name node will be contacted more than once by multiple task trackers uh, back and forth. So all the gray areas, uh, gray arrows on this uh, diagram is essentially what Hadoop does during task, uh, during MapReduce task ex execution. Very verbose process, uh, obviously never built for performance, built for batch-oriented processing. The blue arrow, on the other hand, is what Ignite does. Uh, so essentially, we uh, not only collocate uh, uh, computations uh, with uh, data, MapReduce computations with uh, data, we do it in one step. Uh, we immediately send uh, the computations to the node where the data resides. And on top of that, uh, we often are able to, to collocate in process. So it's a, the job, the MapReduce task itself, will execute in the same Java process where the data is actually cached. So that actually uh, allows us to access data uh, by dereferencing a, po a pointer, which is very fast. And that's where the most acceleration comes by executing MapReduce task in one step and collocating in process. And before I move to, to the demo, I just want to mention that uh, GridGain provides enterprise features on top of Apache Ignite. Uh, GridGain does not change Apache Ignite in any way. As a matter of fact, it plugs in as a uh, plugs in into the plugin architecture provided by uh, Apache Ignite and starts up as an Apache Ignite plugin. Uh, so. 
Uh, this diagram shows all the features available in Ignite and Grid Game. As you see, Grid Game provides a lot of available features that have to do with data center replication, security, management and monitoring, network segmentation, uh, role and upgrades, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So do check it out. Uh, do, uh, you can always download the trial version from uh, uh, GridGame.com website. And the last thing I'll be showing is a demo. Uh, I'll be showing, I'll be comparing Apache Ignite SQL to Spark SQL uh, using a small data set that I've loaded on my laptop. And I'll be showing it using Apache Zeppelin, which is a visual tool uh, for running uh, analytics. And it automatically in integrates with uh, Spark and Ignite, among other projects. So we'll uh, be using Zeppelin for running uh, our SQL queries in this case. So this is what a Zeppelin window looks like. Uh, I am going to actually have two windows open, one for Spark and one for Apache Ignite. I have preloaded about six uh, gigabyte of data into both. Uh, I essentially have one instance of Spark running and one instance of Ignite, both holding six gigabyte of data. Uh, given the today's uh, data sizes, the uh, data I'm working with here is uh, can be considered minuscule. It's uh, we're not doing terabytes here; we're doing just uh, about uh, six gigabyte of data. And uh, what I'm going to do is run a couple of join queries that will do joins between two tables, mainly person and organization. And, uh, we're going, uh, and we're going to see how long each query will take. So let's start from, uh, select, uh, from Spark. We are going to select all person names, manager names, and organization names in, um, uh, by doing a triple join, uh, uh, SQL with triple join based on the data we've loaded. So let's go ahead and run it. We're still running. Spark has to do full scan uh, between two tables, and that's why the query is taking a little bit. Just want to remind you the data set is fairly small, but the full scan on this data set still takes uh, quite a bit of, a bit of time. And the query still has not completed yet, and now it's done. Uh, the execution took about 30 seconds. So let's go ahead and run the same query in Ignite. Um, I have the only difference here is I have to tell Zeppelin that I'm using Ignite interpreter and not Spark interpreter. And I do that by specifying this parameter, ignite.ignitesql. So let's go, uh, the, otherwise the query looks exactly the same. I'm going to go ahead and run it and boom, it's done. So it takes literally uh, less than a second. Uh, Zeppelin actually shows the time of zero, mil, uh, zero seconds. Just to ensure that we have not hard coded anything here, I'm going to change the value maybe to 223. I'm going to run it again. It's done. So all person names, manager names, and organization names are retrieved. So let's execute another query uh, with Spark. And this time we are going to do a group by, order by, and, aver and we are going to select average salaries for all employees for a certain organization. Um, for all managers for a certain organization. So manager ID is uh, null. That means a person is manager. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and run it. Uh, I'm currently in Spark window. We're still running. Again, Spark has to do full scan in order to execute a join between person and organization tables. We're still running. All right, it's almost done. Okay, so it took about 33 seconds and we got uh, the salaries ordered in ascending order. So let's go ahead and run the same query in Ignite. 
again, uh, the only difference is that I specify Ignite Interpreter, run it, it's done. So Zeppelin shows zero seconds. I can actually, just to change the result, I can change ascending to descending here, for example, rerun it, and now the results are shown in descending form. So when I'm, I also mentioned that Zeppelin has some pretty cool graphs uh, to visualize your data, so do take advantage. Uh, whenever playing with Ignite together with Zeppelin. So on this note, I'm going to end uh, our my presentation and I'm going to move to the Q&A session. Hey, thanks for that, uh, Dimitri. Excellent information. And we do have some uh, questions from the audience here. So I'm going to go ahead and run those by you. And by the way, um, may have some time for some additional questions. So if you haven't uh, gotten a question, if you have a, do have a question to ask, go ahead and feel free to um, enter that now. Um, but uh, so here's the first question I've got for you, Dimitri. Um, do you tag the information coming into the network? Do we tag the information coming in into the network? Uh, essentially, uh, I think uh, this question has to do with security, which is something that uh, is provided by Grid Game, actually, not by Ignite. But uh, generally speaking, every node before it receives a packet has to pass uh, through authentication and authorization mechanisms that are built in, and every node be that client or a server node will have to uh, be authenticated before it even enters the the cluster. Okay. Um, excellent. Now here's another one for you. Uh, actually, let me do this one. Um, how do I uh, filter on list within my objects with SQL? All right, so the question is, uh, I think, uh, if I have a nested list inside of my object, how would I filter on it? And my recommendation usually is store all objects in cache individually. You can have multiple caches. As I mentioned, every cache can store different objects. So I would put uh, the objects in the list into one cache and uh, the parents into another cache potentially. And then uh, the filtering would happen by doing a join with a word clause. It's actually very simple. You would, of course, have an index on the join key, and then you would uh, select uh, all persons that work for the organization, let's say, uh, that have certain uh, criteria, like maybe salary less than 50,000. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. And uh, here's another one. Um, you showed SQL queries as text. Is there a builder API? Actually, uh, so the question is uh, if you can have a builder API to build SQL queries. The answer is no, you just, uh, uh, to us a SQL query is a string. I'm sure you can get a builder API for a SQL outside of Ignite. Uh, and uh, for, uh, as I mentioned, the syntax is standard NC99. NC99. So it shouldn't be hard to create. Okay, excellent. Um, next question. Uh, what was the size of the clusters in the demo? Uh, the size of the clusters in the demo was one, actually. So uh, I had one uh, Ignite node running and one Spark node running. So the, on both sides, there was one worker for Spark and one uh, for Ignite. Okay, now there's, that's the, the, the question there, um, as I read it, but do you think they were asking about RAM or, uh, or anything ah, so, uh, so both clusters uh, were running on my laptop. I have a MacBook Pro 13-inch. Uh, total, total data set was about 6 gig. The whole data set was loaded in memory on both servers, uh, uh, Spark and Ignite. And then we ran a scale queries for that. Okay, great. So that uh, thanks for that clarification. Okay, here's another question for you. Uh, in your demo, was the Spark RDD cached prior to running the query? 
Correct. Uh, as a matter of fact, I loaded uh, the data in memory prior to running the query. So the RTD was in memory. Okay, good. Um, and the next question here, uh, is there a way to store consistent snapshots for all data of a map? Uh, so the question is, uh, can we snapshot the cache data, I believe? So right now, uh, there is no built-in mechanism to do a snapshot. Uh, there are several, uh, there is a ticket open uh, on Apache Ignite uh, with several propositions on how to support it. So I believe it will be coming soon. Uh, in the meantime, you can always iterate through cache and serialize uh, the key value pairs into the file and do the reverse on the other side whenever you need to read it, if you really need the snapshotting functionality. All right. Excellent. Um, all right. Here's another question. Uh, is it possible to work with Ignite from any other language other than Java, like Python? Oh, that's a good question. So currently, as I mentioned, we have uh, pretty rich APIs for uh, Java, .NET, and C++. There's also JDBC and ODBC client APIs. Uh, there's also a REST-based connectivity. So there's a pretty powerful REST API, which is very well documented on the Ignite website. So that's one way to interact from Python. We also have a Node.js uh, native client coming out pretty soon, probably within a month or so. So additional languages are coming, but for the languages that we don't have direct API for, there's always a REST protocol that you could utilize. All right, another question. Uh, how do you compare Ignite data grid capabilities with Hazelcast? All right, uh, so how does Ignite compare to Hazelcast? We get that question uh, a lot. Uh, so I would say that uh, one of the, Ignite has uh, quite a few unique features that are not present in other data grid uh, products. First of all, Ignite is an in-memory data fabric. It's not just a data grid. It's more than a data grid. And data grid is just one of the components that we provide, while Hazelcast is a data grid product. So data grid is everything that Hazelcast provides. Uh, so even within data grid, I think there are quite a few unique features in Ignite that are not available in, Hazel, in Hazelcast. One of the main ones would be SQL capabilities. As I mentioned, we are NC99 SQL compliant, and you can do distributed joins on SQL. In Hazelcast, for example, you wouldn't be able to do uh, a, a join with or without SQL. So you always have to bring data back and forth to connect any type of uh, different types of data. In Ignite, you just do it with one SQL query. You can do joins across uh, two, three, four, five tables together, uh, add, an index, uh, add a few indexes in cache, and the join should work pretty fast. So SQL is definitely probably the biggest differentiator there are quite a few others. Uh, for example, our transaction support, I believe, is a lot better. Uh, like I mentioned, there's a deadlock-free uh, mode for uh, uh, for the transactions, so you never have to worry about uh, acquiring uh, locks in the same order. Uh, the performance, uh, we do benchmarks against KLTS, and we also uh, we generally come on, come on top. We publish all the benchmarks and all the code for the benchmarks, so you can always come and take a look. I'm sure there are quite a few more differences. Uh, they're all listed uh, on, uh, by the way, Ignite website. There is a comparison, uh, there are a few comparison pages where we compare Ignite to Hazelcast and to other data grids. So do visit Ignite website for a detailed list of differences. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question, can I use stored procedures and functions? Oh, that's a good question. Can I use store procedures and functions in SQL? So right now we support functions. You can define custom functions that you can call in your uh, SQL queries. So for example, if you have a, uh, some uh, uh, non-standard behavior or some discrepancy in behavior of a certain function uh, when converting a database query to Ignite query, you can always create, a, uh, fix it in Java code. You can create your own logic for a function and then use it in SQL uh, down the road. Uh, the PL SQL itself is not supported. So we 
don't really have a need for it because we have a compute grid. And if you need to execute any kind of operation on the data, uh, you just uh, send the computation to the nodes where the data is and perform all, all the updates directly from Java. So there's no real need to do it from a PLSQL standpoint. All right, great. Um, and we do have uh, several questions, but uh, if, if you did have a question that you wanted to ask, uh, feel free to get it in. And again, if we can't get to it on this call, we'll follow up with, a, with an answer to your questions by email. But uh, here's your next question, uh, Dimitri. It's um, uh, how do I re-index, or I'm sorry, how re-index happens in cache, uh, same as database? Okay. All right, so uh, let me try to make sense <laughs> out of this. So essentially, indexes are dynamic. They work, uh, uh, they're always up to date. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, uh, the Ignite is always consistent, and you never get an uh, uh, inconsistent read or write. The same goes for indexes. Uh, so as you update data in caches, the data updates uh, propagate uh, 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 the, the, the index updates, I'm sorry, are also happen simultaneously. So indexes are always in sync with the cache data. I hope that was the okay. question. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and, and you know, feel free, uh, everyone on the call, to you know, uh, email uh, uh, Dimitri uh, and or you know, um, sales at. Uh, uh, Grid gain, or just go to the Apache Ignite website if you've got questions afterwards, and you can get those answered. But here uh, are some other questions. Um, how good is Ignite for parallel processing? We currently have SQL Server, and it uh, it has a lot of uh, intentions with deadlocks. We have evaluated few a few distributed database products, but none of them seem to scale well. Well, I mean, uh, this. Uh Interesting question, sir, because Ignite is all about parallel processing. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ignite doesn't have non-parallel processing. So we believe we're pretty good at parallel processing. Uh, all the queries get automatically split across multiple nodes. And uh, uh, the, the data set also gets split across multiple nodes. So just because each node has a small, smaller data set, just by virtue of that, you get faster query execution. And on top of that, we have all the indexes that are also split across multiple nodes. So all the indexes are processed in parallel as well. And as I mentioned, as far as deadlocks go, we implemented a deadlock-free approach. So you should not, if you use our deadlock-free transactions, you will never run into a deadlock scenario within a minute. All right, uh, fantastic. And, and I think we got time for one really quick answer. Let me uh, run this one by. Is it possible to add event listeners on value changes in caches? Not all cache values, but only some specific value of interest. That one you can answer uh, so, in one minute? Yes, I can. So the question is, uh, can I react to updates? Can I subscribe listeners to cache updates? And can I only subscribe listeners to a subgroup of cache updates? The answer is yes. We have a concept of continuous query, part of our open, uh, part of Apache Ignite, and uh, uh, continuous query has a, a concept of remote filter, the filter that would execute directly on the server where the update happens. So that's where the first uh, degree, first level of filtering will take place, and then whatever passes the remote filter will be shipped to the client, and uh, on client you can set up additional filters. So the answer is uh, use continuous queries. Uh, they're very well documented on Apache Net website. All right. Uh, thanks for that answer, uh, Dimitri. And there's uh, a few other questions that we just didn't have time to get to. We're up against the end of our time today. But as I said, uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, follow up with the answers to, to those questions um, uh, by email. So I want to thank Dimitri first for uh, you know all that excellent information about Apache Ignite. I want to thank all of you who asked such excellent questions. I hope you got a lot of value from today's presentation. Um, just a reminder that there is, you can download the PDF version of that from the resources uh, widget, and we will also be posting an on-demand version of this webinar. Uh, to the website, and you'll receive an email with the uh, information about where to get that. 
So, again, thank you all for attending today. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. And have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.